Hello and welcome to the Trapital Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Runcy. Our guest today is Mike Wiseman, who is the president of SoundCloud. This is a company that I have written about and covered long before starting Trapital, and I think it's one of the more interesting streaming services, specifically as it relates to hip hop. So I'm definitely excited for this conversation. And with that, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm a longtime follower and fan of your material, so it's exciting to get a uh, conversation going here. Thanks. I know we're talking a little bit before we started recording, but I had just connected the dots a month or two ago that you and Andy Wiseman, partner at Union Square Venture, were brothers. <laughs> it is a small world. Yeah, he is, he is both my brother and they are one of our investors. Uh, but it's great to have him as a, as a brother and also a support for business stuff, too. It's just a fantastic relationship. Nice. Yeah, I think I first heard it was, um, I think it was on a Peter Kafka Recode podcast. He was the one that had to mention it. And then knowing the two, knowing of the two of you individually, I was like, wait a second. No, th- there's, and that's when I hit, uh, that's when I hit Andy up about it. Yeah. And, and he is, as you know, is quite knowledgeable about music, music history, what's going on with the market right now. He keeps up to speed. It's hard to keep up to speed with him. It definitely is. He is he is prolific on Twitter. He's dropping artists that even I hadn't hear, heard about. And this is my livelihood to make sure I'm up on this stuff. First, I'd love to hear a little bit about your transition to SoundCloud. So two years ago, you come from Vimeo. This was a company that was strong. You and Carrie Trainer, who is your then CEO, now CEO here, decide to make the leap over, and you joined SoundCloud at a very interesting time. There were a ton of layoffs, investors getting nervous, there was difficulty finding a buyer, and I think the product itself had some questions, and folks like myself had written about some of the challenges. I'm curious, why did you decide to join at that moment? You know, there's there's a couple ways to think about it, and, um, you know, it's been an incredibly exciting two-year run since we've been here, but... Um, a couple of things where, you know, Carrie and I were talking about, uh, Carrie had left Vimeo. I was you know, generally running the Vimeo business for about a year after he left. Uh, we sort of talked about working together again at some points. And, and so this opportunity was a good, you know, sort of personal fit for both of us. Um, second was, you know, we had uh, in uh, at Vimeo, we had looked at the essentially the landscape in a couple of ways. We looked at it very similar to the way we look at it at SoundCloud, that there's a creator or artist-facing side of the business, and then there's a consumer-facing side of the business. Uh, at Vimeo, what we realized is in the creator-facing side, in video, there's a lot of technology that's been developed. Um, there's robust technology for editing. Uh, you have big players like Adobe and Apple involved. And, uh, and then the consumer side of, of video is obviously now moving heavily into streaming with Netflix and Amazon and YouTube. Um, but when we looked at music, we actually said to ourselves, wait a minute, there's a whole other opportunity here the sort of creator-facing side of music is actually very underdeveloped. Um, a lot of that was stemming from the fact that the music industry for you know the last 20 years was in somewhat of a decline position up until the last couple of years ago. And so that whole side of the market we were thinking to ourselves is, wow, that's a huge opportunity. Um, then we looked at a lot of the things in music and we said, wait a minute, what's the best position company to sort of approach that side of the market? And that was SoundCloud. At the same time, SoundCloud was going through, you know, obviously some financial difficulties, um, some team transition, and so that that sort of opportune time between us working together, industry opportunity, plus then SoundCloud effectively, you know, uh, having the right time, the right moment uh, was the right time for us to jump into it. So more about the creators itself, what did you think was the biggest opportunity there? I, I definitely understand the opportunity to focus on them, but what did you think was missing from what some of the other players in the marketplace weren't offering? Well, I think it's more, it's, it's more about what the creator's life cycle is about to be. So the thing that, that, we're, that I saw was as the consumer side of streaming is growing, now it was gone from you know, $15 billion in revenue a year to $20 billion in revenue a year, what that means is there's more opportunities for more independent creators, more emerging talent to bubble up. And we saw a couple things. One is offering them better tools, um, better technology to access their fans, better ways to read their data. Um, the second thing was also better ways to monetize their work and to make an earn a living from their music. So whether that's from you know distributing onto SoundCloud or distributing onto other platforms, that market I think is just blossoming. And we saw that all of those pieces, sort of one single company that could fit across all of that, and the best position company for that was SoundCloud. 
So since creators are a bit more of your focus than subscribers, the way that a SoundCloud or or not a SoundCloud, the way that a Spotify or a Netflix looks at their subscribers, they're often telling their investors and telling the media, don't focus on our profitability, focus on our customer acquisition, cost, lifetime value ratios, focus on that more than anything. Do you look at that similarly with the cost to acquire a creator and the lifetime value of a creator on the platform? Absolutely. I mean, we, we do have sort of fairly financially rigorous ways that we look at it. So the SoundCloud business works in a couple ways. Uh, one is we have a creator-facing business where we offer a series of premium software products like SoundCloud Pro and Pro Unlimited. Um, those people can purchase on a monthly basis for anywhere from 8 to $12. Uh, we have uh, an offering where it allows creators to distribute their work into other streaming services where we take effectively a rev share or participate with those artists. Uh, and then we do have a consumer business where if you come to SoundCloud, in most markets around the world, you listen to SoundCloud for free, there'll be some advertising. You can turn off ads and pay a subscription fee, which is SoundCloud Go Plus. Um, and the way that we look at a lot of that is we look at it very similar to the way you, you know, you've seen Spotify describe it or other subscription businesses like a Netflix or even a Sirius. Um, how much does it cost to acquire a subscriber? What is the purchase rate of that subscriber? How long do they stay? That equals the lifetime value. And then how much is that lifetime value against that original cost to purchase? So we look at the same three to one, five to one ratios. Can we, can we acquire a customer for you know, a fifth of the cost that it is that we actually earn off that customer? So with that creator strategy, do you now look at a company like STEM or United Masters just as much as the competition as you might a sound as you might a Spotify? Uh, definitely. I mean, we we run and uh, we run a fairly large distribution business with inside SoundCloud. So, from your core SoundCloud Pro and Pro Mode account today, uh, if you're eligible, you can actually now distribute your music off of SoundCloud into other streaming services. Uh, we acquired a business earlier this year called Repost Network that offers a higher touch service. So we work directly with artists, um, a little bit more qualified, and we help place them into all the other major streaming services. Uh, we also help them market their work, too. So in that way, you know, we're looking at United Masters, we're looking at STEM, uh, DistroKid, TuneCore's of the world as well. I'm interested at the business model specifically, because I know you charge the 8 to $12 a month. I think if you get it at the right time, you can get the promotional rate in there, but I know that some of the competitors like STEM or United Masters, it's a revenue share per, um, percentage. Is there a reason that you went with the flat rate instead of the percentage? Uh, well, we do have both now. So we do on our uh, core subscription products, SoundCloud Pro and Pro Unlimited, uh, we do charge a subscription fee. Our, our uh, services distribution offering, which is powered by Repost, the business we acquired, that is more of a revenue share or participation model. Uh, and I think it, I think we actually like both models, I and mean, I think we're the only one of the only one company in the out there that actually has both models today. So one is, if you're the artist, you know, and you want to pay a fee, uh, we're very much hands off. We're sort of letting you have the software, the tools to yourself, very similar to what you get with a distro kid, or even another piece of software product like buying a plugin. It's on your own to sort of make what you what you want with it. With a services fee. You get more. You get marketing support, potentially an account manager to help you, really help actually now participate and build your career. So on that side, we're actually working alongside an artist in a lot of ways and really participating with their success. And whether they have success or there's some that don't, we also take that risk as well. So I think there's a, there's a healthy blend to having both models, and the two of them together actually give the artist the most opportunity. And with that, would you say that the cost to serve the customer, whether that's the account manager that you had referenced or another type of customer service, is that the largest expense? Because that's what I often hear from some of those other distributing services, that the customer service piece ends up being the most, most expensive. Uh, that is one of the bit larger expenses. Uh, I mean, it's just general overhead, like teams, um, everything from engineering product to customer support. Um, the actual cost of distributing a track from us into a streaming service is fairly low. You'll hear a lot of times these are commodity-like businesses. That's really not the case. Um, it actually takes a lot of product and engineering work to distribute a track. Each and every DSP or streaming service has their own requirements and specifications, so we have to really figure out how to get that track properly into each service. Um, and then in addition to that, it's the customer support, 
it's the account management, it's the marketing that we do and the promotional work that we do on behalf of an artist. So you add up all of those things, and, and you know, it's not to say it's uh, a ton of expense, but there is a lot of capital that we're actually putting towards supporting that, that, that artist. So with all the support and all of these initiatives, and all of this sounds like it's exactly what artists need, needs being able to meet them in different places, is there a ideal timeline where an artist no longer needs SoundCloud or they go on their own. I know we've seen examples like Lil Tecca, who had recently just signed with Republic Records, but do you look at those as more success stories? Do you look at those as, okay, the longer we can keep someone on this platform, the better? What does that look like? I think it's more of a spectrum. And this is something that we're, we're seeing in the market. And, and you know, it's, it's a little bit more sort of artist dependent on where they are in their life cycle, their stage of their career. So the way we look at it is, like, think of a bell curve. Sort of, you have a curve that goes up, you sort of hit a peak, and then the curve goes down. So when artists on that earlier side of the career, that's an artist who's building fans, figuring out their sound, uh, deciding how they're going to be an influencer, how they're going to market, um, sort of getting honing where to sort of put their, put their effort. At the sort of peak or the crest of that, that curve is, you know, hopefully that artist has some success. They've gotten through. They've broken through. They're actually earning some significant, you know, significant streaming revenue. They may be touring then. And then there's also the part of the curve that, you know, we tend not to think about in a lot of the stuff we read is the artist is now sort of coming down from that. Um, they've built a fan base. They've built a catalog. Uh, they actually probably want to have a sustainable career over 10, 20, 30 years. And the part of the set that actually what we offer and what some of the distribution companies offer is for that beginning part of the curve and the end part of the curve serves it really well. And that's where you see a lot of artists actually becoming independent. So you can do it on your own. You can earn more revenue. Uh, it's that on your way up. And then artists who've also, you know, a major label and you may not work for them anymore. They're not in the front line. They're sort of more in the catalog uh, section for the labels. Those types of distribution services also really work well for those. It's that part in the middle where that artist is gaining traction, you know, needs to go global, thinking about radio promotion, wants expert support. The labels are still great for that. And so we're not saying stay independent forever and never leave, you know, the SoundCloud environment or never leave an independent distribution service. If you need that type of support, go get it because that's going to be what's probably best for you at that point in your career. A lot of this makes me think about tech and the parallels there, because now more than ever, you're starting to see so many companies shy away from VC funding. They don't necessarily want to chase a large venture capital firm to try to grow to skyrocket levels the same way that someone may not want to join a Republic or a Columbia to get all the support in the world. And seeing how in tech, there's so many examples now of whether it's different types of accelerators or different types of VC firms that are a bit more focused on profitability, sustainability, and being able to meet you where you are. And that sounds very similar to that spectrum that you're explaining about where SoundCloud fits. Yeah, it's, it's where the, you know, we're the accelerator, the sort of the early stage accelerator into you know, VC terms, series A, series B, where you're starting to get some traction, you're figuring out your business model, you're you know, in sort of tech talk, your product market fit, who's the audience, how are you going to market that? That's really where SoundCloud is, you know, sort of that global accelerator of music and music culture. Um, now, when an artist starts to get more traction, then that's where they decide, okay, can I do this on my own? Do I need more money, more capital? In the same way a business says, wait, I can expand, I can go global, I can open up international offices, I can add more marketing dollars. Um, in order to do that, I may need more money. And at that point, you make the decision, do you just try to keep building on your own or do you go try to look for more money? And typically, they, that's when you bring in a later stage investor, a uh, growth equity VC fund, a private equity fund. Uh, in the same way in music, that's where you know, the labels come in. They can offer bigger checks, bigger resources. And so that, it's a very similar model uh, in that way in sort of the incubator to, to you know, seed investor, to series A investor, to growth equity in the music world, starting on SoundCloud, getting with a dis distribution service, to then potentially moving up to a major label. A lot of the artists that are in that, across that spectrum, specifically in the early stages, 
those are the people that have collectively been called SoundCloud rappers over the past few years. And yeah. I know the term is often used pejoratively, but what does the term mean to you? What do you mean? What does it mean when you hear SoundCloud rapper? I mean, you know, you can think about the way the music sounds, but that is at this point, the sounds have gotten much different. I think the way I think about it is it's more do it yourself, it's immediate. Um, it's taking a track that you just made on your phone and putting it up into the cloud and getting it out to your audience. Um, it's more of that sort of that punk ethos around music than it is anything that's specifically around, you know, the lyrics, the sound. Um, you know, you could say it's the, the different pieces of it. it's really about the ethos and the, the the movement at large, which is really about getting your music out there, getting to your fans, um, doing it without you know a large amount of support. And it's, it's really what actually is sort of, you know, always made music really special, that that always comes up in different generations. You know, as I said, sort of whether it's punk or it's, you know, a different genre that's emerging. Um, interestingly, you know, in the U.S., we're very hip-hop focused. Outside the U.S., SoundCloud has a lot of other genres that are bubbling up every day. That's not just what we would consider in the U.S. to be SoundCloud rap. So why do you think that's different outside the U.S.? Uh, music is very local. So... You know, one example is we actually are, I think, one of the top, you know, two or three uh, music streaming services in Egypt right now. Eighty-five uh, percent of the people listening to music in Egypt on SoundCloud are listening to music that was uploaded from Egypt. So it's inherently that local music scene, you know, put out there in the digital world. And so in the U.S., that that local music scene has definitely, you know, shifted into hip hop and, and SoundCloud rap. Um, but other countries are, are sort of, you know, that local music scene that's bubbling up, and whether it's politically themed or uh, emotionally themed or talking about issues that they're facing in their home country, uh, it's very naturally aligned with the local side. So when you see a trend like that, like with Egypt, for example, is there a concerted effort internally in the company to try to nurture that or find out what's happening on the ground or see if there's an opportunity to build uh, some creator tactics to help? see what the landscape might be? Absolutely. I mean, we would love to be everywhere at all times. Um, we do have to pick and choose, you know, where, where we focus our efforts, but we're seeing, we're seeing similar things, you know, we see it in Egypt, we see it in Africa, a lot of really interesting trends coming, uh, Indonesia. And so what we try to do is one is we obviously use data. Um, we use a lot of data to sort of look and see what's happening, you know, from, from wherever we're sitting, uh, then we try to, you know, try to put some folks in the ground there. We've, and we've built out a pretty, f a fairly large team that is now essentially artist, artist, label, uh, independent label relations that goes out there and tries to get embedded into these music scenes. And I think we'll be doing a lot more of that over the next year or two. Are there any regions that the average person wouldn't recognize like, oh, wow, I didn't know that SoundCloud had a lot of presence there. There was something there. Like Egypt definitely perked my interest, but what are, what are a few others? Yeah, the, the Middle East, um, the Middle East and it's Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE. Uh, we do have a lot of a uh, lot of usage. Um, uh, Eastern Europe, um, you have a lot of usage just coming out of there. And again, it's not like this is people in Eastern Europe listening to you know Drake or uh, Chance. It's people in Eastern Europe listening to music that's coming out of there. And then also Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, a lot of those sort of emerging scenes where. Um, in a lot of ways, it's also uh, at a geopolitical level. It's where countries are opening up a little bit more. And then the art scene has a little bit more freedom. And the best place to sort of get your art out there, if it's music, is generally using SoundCloud or an open platform like ours. That makes sense. And with that, as you mentioned, the geopolitical aspect, I know that the concept of free speech and all that has been widely discussed in several things, whether it's the NBA or other aspects. Is, does the content of any of that free speech in any of those countries that are having um, geopolitical differences or transitions, is any of that something that you've all had to make decisions on or be cognizant of? We're always cognizant of it. Um, and we take trust and safety, copyright policy incredibly seriously. So we have a series of community-based filters where if, you know, someone who's listening to something sees something that shouldn't really be there, and whether it's uh, derogatory or considered hate speech, uh, that immediately gets flagged to us, gets taken down. Um, we have a trust and safety team that uh, works with regulatory bodies around the world to make sure you know, that we're sort of always in compliance. Uh, and then additionally, we have technical filters that actually try to make sure that there's 
not uh, illicit imagery that's uploaded on a profile. Uh, and so we, we try to keep it as, pos- uh, as, as potentially uh, clean as possible. But at the same time, we also realize you know, music also has a lot of uh, content behind it that you know, can be misheard or misread. And so we're trying to keep that balance between keeping it free and open, but also making sure that, that it's a safe place to, for fans and audiences. That makes sense. Um, one of the things that I think is unique about SoundCloud is the connection between both artists and fans, because this is something that intentionally doesn't exist in the other DSPs. So for instance, I've spoken to folks at record labels and they have said themselves that they know for a fact that SoundCloud will not and has no plans to let their creators or let their artists know who their followers are because the fear is that they might find out who those folks are. They might then go off of the platform to connect with them. And if they're not spending time on Spotify to do that, then there is a lost opportunity there for a number of different reasons. Was that ever a concern at all with SoundCloud enabling the creator and fan connections? No. Um, it's almost the exact opposite. We're trying to to push the creator to fan connection and keep it um, as close as possible. Uh, there, I mean, there's a couple fundamental things that are different about SoundCloud. Is one is we're an open platform, so you can upload, and that track is then immediately available in real time to everyone in the world. The other streaming services are essentially licensing catalog from various rights holders around the world, and it's a very sort of clean, well lit, um, almost like a retail like experience. And so they're they're very much curating that content, putting it into the right places. SoundCloud inherently it, it's built as a creator to fan connection. Um, in fact, if you go to our mobile app, you know now that we've we've rebuilt into the mobile app things like commenting on a track. Um, we've even started to do things like AMAs between artists and their fans, where the artist can come in at a certain time, you know, ask me anything, and the fans are actually responding directly. And so that's not necess- That's actually us trying to get the the fan to artist relationship as close as possible. Um, and there's a series of other things that we do to sort of keep that relationship going. Yeah, and I think part of the value for SoundCloud having that is because at least now, there still is a good amount of exclusive content on the platform, which is very different than the other services, whether that is derivative or whether it is an artist that is using the that solely as the connection point. It's much more different than you know someone going to try to listen to the latest Drake album when that literally can be found everywhere. It's completely true. So, so two things. We have we have available. I think it's two hundred and five million tracks uh, publicly available for listening on SoundCloud. The other streaming services, depending on how they calculate it, have somewhere between thirty to maybe I've heard as many as fifty. So, we're working with you know somewhere between six, five to six times as many tracks as available. And the difference is we allow people to upload unfinished work, unpolished work, uh, DJ sets, uh, and those are the things that are sort of what really makes SoundCloud unique. Uh, and the majority of our listening is actually on the stuff that doesn't come from the major labels, even though we have some of it on the site as well. At the same time, we're also making sure we work with our rights holder partners and major labels to, to really sort of make sure that the, the work coming from them is also showcased and, and marketed in the right way. Um, the other thing I'd add is there is someone who has sort of described this well to me as um, the way to think about SoundCloud is it's the place where it feels like the artist is on the other side of the account. Um, and in reality, we've actually seen it where like, we think you know, Drake has actually gone in there and logged into his own profile, and he's connecting with a fan directly. The other streaming services, you'll never feel that way, where it's actually the artist who's controlling the other side. I think about the artists that have blown up on SoundCloud, like Chance comes to mind specifically. Even though he got his rise there, they still haven't necessarily like, forgotten their roots. I remember... You know, right around the time that you joined, he was one of the first people to tweet out like, oh, I'm going to check on SoundCloud. And I'm curious, like, what is that like? What does that alumni network look like? And is that something that can help, you know, continue to support or connect the artist down the road? Because, as you said, if that type of connection that Drake would have with SoundCloud doesn't exist with the others, how do the artists feel like they might be able to get something or benefit from that alumni network. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's you always, you always come back home in some ways. Um, you know, it's from Chance the Rapper to, you know, even someone like Post Malone or in a lot of ways like Billie Eilish. It's the artists that we consider it kind of first on SoundCloud. It's where they got their first traction, found their first fans. 
uh, really started to build the, the early part of their career. Uh, and, and we see, a, you know, there's dozens of those examples. Uh, a majority of those artists, even though after they've made sort of mainstream top 40 success, signed to a major label deal, uh, they do come back to us because that's, that's where the fans still live. And that's where sort of those, uh, those younger fans who are really hungry to discover and find new music live. And also, it's the place where they feel sort of a lot of them feel it's the most authentic place to, to connect with your fan directly. Um, some of the other streaming services, well, I think they're unbelievably great products, incredibly amazing that you can listen to any song anywhere in the world that coming from like the major rights holders and independents, it doesn't have that same connection that, that, that SoundCloud did for a lot of those artists. Right. Thinking a bit more about the concept of creators themselves, and I know that we've often been focusing on the artist, but what does the non-artist creator look like in your definition? Is this, I know it's podcasters, but who else? Is it a pretty broad definition? It's a very broad definition. Um, and the way that we break it down uh, is uh, sort of into four general areas. And it's, it's really hard to pinpoint a personality, so you know, bear with me as I go through this. But we think about artists as musicians, singers, songwriters, uh, people in a band, people who are writing tracks, uh, rapping on tracks. Um, then we think about the producer category, and there's millions of folks on SoundCloud who are producers, um, who are looking for new acts to work with, helping them manage in some way, uh, making beats in a lot uh, it's a big, it's a big activity. Um, the producer is also very close to musician. Musicians can come, become producers. We also think about DJs. Um, you know, we have several million DJs who use SoundCloud, and sort of traditionally you think of the performing DJ, but these are also people who are performing at a wedding or for a friend's party or just going to a club down the street. Um, and then we do have speech and podcast. Uh, and so we, that creator can be someone who's actually creating the underlying material. They're also someone who is part of that, that core working group. Um, they can be sort of in a support function, a, a manager. And there's a lot of sort of areas, and a lot of people move in and out of a lot of those different areas too. So it's not just when you think about a SoundCloud rapper, that's what we consider a creator. It's much broader than that. And is there a thought, or maybe this is already happening, around being able to form the connections and bonds between those? Because a lot of those people naturally would want to work together, and some of them are just putting their stuff out there. And of course, there's marketplaces like BeatStars where folks can buy services from one another. But because SoundCloud is serving so many of those people that would naturally work together are there opportunities and connections for them to naturally blend or naturally collaborate? I mean, and it organically and naturally happens every day. Um, you'd, you'd be surprised how many times we see, you know, uh, what we consider a creator to a creator, you know, send a link or send an account uh, comment. And so that happens naturally. We're, we're doing more to, to build that out. So we're doing things like enhancing someone's profile. So it's really your calling card. And in your profile today in SoundCloud, you know, unlike some of the other uh, streaming services, you can put in your Instagram link, you can put in a TikTok link, tell us where you're going on tour. Hey, reach out to me if you want me to help you make beats. Uh, that eventually leads us into, do we get it deeper into those areas of sort of you know, pure, pure creative collaboration as well? So it happens a lot of it today. We're building more features against it. I'd probably say we're going to start to, to look at doing more things in that area. Could you ever see yourself building a marketplace around it the same way that Beat Stars has theirs, possibly. Um, where the amazing thing about SoundCloud is, there's lots of areas for us to go into. It's just where we prioritize our efforts, but that's definitely an area we've considered uh, multiple times. Yeah, I definitely thought about that. One of the other places I thought about too was broader partnerships, because so many of these creators, both artists and producers and number of the ones you mentioned are constantly thinking about what are what is their brand and as they continue to grow and their fame increases they're looking at different partnerships with whether it's clothing companies or instagram um influence strat, uh collaboration stuff like that is that anything that um you've been thinking about, okay, how could we best potentially support these? Or is that something that you think is out of scope? That is definitely in scope. We're, um, we're building out what we call our services capabilities where you know, we can work with artists. Like the baseline is we help them get distributed into the other streaming services. Uh, we'll help them do DSP or streaming service marketing. 
Um, at the very high level, we've actually started to help work with artists to help them get video game sync licenses. Oh, um, interesting. To yeah, say more about yeah, that. Yeah, so, 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 you know, between our audience and a lot of the sort of, you know, video game publishers, there's a whole world of sync, which is typically you think of as TV and film, but actually video games is a huge market. Um, and in particular for a lot of like hip hop, EDM, uh, electronic based music, sort of a, a burgeoning market to get your tracks into a video game. So we, we've, you know, started to form partnerships along that area um, and helping those artists get placed into video games. We thought about ways in which we can, you know, help an artist if you want to go on tour. Can we support that? Um, and sort of all of those things that you know allow a emerging uh, allow emerging talent to build out their career versus just the hey engage with technology and go from there. Right. Talk to me a little bit about podcasting. This is of course a big opportunity for creators. A lot of the other DSPs have focused on creating original content to add higher profit margin opportunity to the revenue mix. Is this something that you're all considering? Yeah, I mean, we, we consider it in a couple of ways. One is we're, we're probably one of the largest host of podcasts. So um, anyone can upload a podcast to SoundCloud. You can buy a premium account, and you can then point that podcast and distribute it from SoundCloud into uh, Apple and other uh, podcast downloads you know, areas. So we're building out that functionality. Um, we're also trying to figure out ways that we can sort of introduce podcasts into the experience. Uh, I think everyone's trying to figure this out, you know, Pandora has the podcast genome project. Uh, Spotify has been experimenting with the ways to present it. Um, but the trick is how do you present a spoken word, 30 minute spoken word uh, track, effectively track next to a music track in the same experience. And so I think that's where we're trying to figure out how to develop it. And so it's not just, hey, listen to three hip hop songs and I got a Wall Street Journal podcast and then three more hip hop songs. No, that makes sense. Last couple of questions for you before we let you go. Um, when you made the transition over, I believe Carrie was the one that had helped orchestrate the deal to get the investment banks to become large investors to help support and provide SoundCloud with that $170 million. Now that it's been two years underway, do you feel like the direction that you and Carrie see and the speed at which you want to go is aligned with what the investors have for SoundCloud? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Carrie and I were intimately involved together in, in bringing that fundraising together. Um, importantly, you know, uh, the two founders, Alex and Eric, were also intimately involved. Um, they were unbelievably gracious in sort of helping transition to a new leadership team. So between the founding group, the investor group, and then obviously myself and Carrie, it's, it's uh, you know, you say these things, these things work out really well. Sometimes they don't. This one's working out really well, where we have sort of everyone aligned and bought in on on what we're trying to do. And I think that's because we're not necessarily going, saying we're going straight at Amazon, Apple, um, Spotify, uh, but we're really sort of taking it more from that artist-centric approach. And I think that's really been the clarifying area that's helped all of us get aligned. Got it. Is there one artist that you didn't know about before you got to SoundCloud, but now since being in the business, being in this role, you're like, huh, all right, no, I'm now listening to this person. That's, that's someone that I'm regularly checking out. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'd have to, let me, let me think about that one uh, for a second. I'd have to say it's probably, I've actually been listening to a lot more chants than I had before. My, my background is I li- I'm more of a rock, uh, even you know, moving into heavy metal fan. So when I came to SoundCloud, I actually been listening to a lot of, got into a lot more Post Malone. I got into a lot more uh, Little Uzi, uh, Trippy nice, Red. Nice. So my, my music sh- my music taste has been shifting uh, more and more towards a lot of the big SoundCloud artists. Nice. I'd even say, as funny as it is, even as someone that's grown up with hip-hop my whole life, since starting Trapital, I've yeah. started to listen and um, seek out artists that I never even thought that I would have. So it's interesting what work will do in that yeah. transition. Who's your, who's your new favorite artist that you've heard recently? Uh, recently, YBN Corday. I think he is great. He recently had a freestyle on Funk Flex. He was on Saturday Night Live performing with Anderson Pock. I definitely recommend him if you haven't. He's, I'm excited to see where he goes. Yeah, he, he, he's the one guy I'm checking out. Last question for you. I saw the notice that was posted for Lil Tecca when he got the deal with Republic 
there was a picture with someone on your team, someone on Republic and him, and he got these orange and white sneakers that looked fresh as anything. And I'm trying to see if I can get a pair of these. I hit up um, Avery Littman to see if I can get a pair and he laughed, but he didn't quite confirm. So is there any way I can get a pair of those from anyone at SoundCloud? Well, we, let's talk offline about that. I, I saw those <laughs> shoes in person when they first got arrived to our office, and I, they were really hot. Um, yeah, well, let, let's, let's chat offline about getting a custom pair of Nikes. Uh, I've been looking for those myself, too. Nice, nice. Okay, we're, we're in the same ballpark. We're in the yeah. same ballpark there. And for the listeners, I'll add a link in the show notes so you can see what these sneakers look like. Uh, Mike, before we let you go, anything that our listeners of the Traffital audience should know about? No, I think the the stuff that you put out there is fantastic and uh, really interesting insights into the industry, uh, artist trends, uh, market trends. So, you know, big fan and I you know, hope everyone keeps reading and listening. All right. Great. Mike, pleasure having you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell at least one friend about this podcast Word of mouth is still the best way to grow. Go to Apple Podcast, go to iTunes, leave a review, rate the podcast. I will screenshot and share the podcast ratings on Twitter and Instagram. That can encourage more people to share the podcast. And if this podcast is your first introduction to Trapital, then make sure you check out the rest of the content. Go to Trapital.co. That's T-R-A-P-I-T-A-L dot C-O. Sign up for the weekly newsletter. Get all the content there. And also, shoot me a text. That's also a great way to stay in touch with Trapital content. You can text me, Dan Runcie, at 415-234-3074. Thanks again. See you next week.